When the rain comes, they run and hide their head. The night is well be dead. When the rain comes, You're listening to Live on Four Legs, the live Pearl Jam podcast experience featuring Mr. Stone Gossip. Fucking camera in the truck. Mr. Boom Gasper! You can call me L, you can call me Ed, you just, just fucking call me, why don't you? Hello everyone, welcome to Live on Four Legs, the definitive live Pearl Jam podcast. Randy Sobel here, and uh, thank you for tuning in. Last week we came back, we came back strong with Soldier Field, and it was a really good episode, and uh, thank you guys for tuning in and being a part of this uh, once again, as we're clearly back from our little summer break that we were doing, and uh, just for all of you that are tuning in for the first time, because this is a pretty prime episode here, Uh, this is a show that a lot of people uh, are going to want to listen to, Uh, it's a show that a lot of people talk about for years and years and years. Uh, So if you're new to this podcast and this episode has drawn you in, just to let you know, we are a podcast that focuses on nothing but the live Pearl Jam performances. Uh, Everything from every era. This is obviously the 92 era, but we do everything from now to 2003 to binaural to yield to no code to avocado back and forth and up and down all over the place. We've done everything almost every year that Pearl Jam has toured so far and we're not stopping. So we are going back a little bit of ways. We, the last time, so I'm going to introduce our, uh, our fourth and final leg, our new co-host here in a second. The last time you heard him, he was actually doing a show from 1992, the Zurich show, if you remember. So let me introduce to you our fourth and final leg along with John and Matt, Please welcome Chris Buckley to the podcast officially as a co-host. <laughs> what well, thank is you very up? much, Randy. What's Cong- up? What's up? Thank you so much. Congratulations. This is a spot that I've coveted for you for a long time. I, I, I've been scouting. I've been doing a lot of scouting, uh, <laughs> you know, since since uh, since Matt had kind of been in and out, uh, and, and you were definitely high on my scouting list. And You never give anybody an eight, but you had some sevens in there. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I definitely appreciate the kind words. And uh, what can I say? It's an honor. I'm excited to be here. Let's do it. What uh, What are you looking forward to the most uh, doing the show? Like, what, what are some of the things you're looking forward to talking about? Honestly, I, th- I think just by the nature of the show, obviously, we have to listen to the bootlegs, right, to be able to cover each show. So uh, there's as, no way big a fan, as big a fan as I am and, and so many of us are, there's always going to be bootlegs that we've never heard. There's shows that we forget about that we haven't heard in years, etc. So I think just the chance to go back and rediscover and discover possibly some new shows that we've never heard before that we fall in love with. And it'll give us a, give me a chance to really explore and, and hopefully find some stuff, uh, unearth some gems, uh, so to speak, that I maybe was never even aware of before. So I think that's pretty enticing. Absolutely, and I think um, what's 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 great that you bring to the table is that you're really tapped in to a lot of their early stuff. I know uh, yes. so you've been even requesting... though I wasn't around for it. <laughs> no, we. I mean, none of us here were really around for it. So, uh, but that's okay because you know, better late than never. Uh, right. But you know, I think we've talked so much about you know when when are we going to do Indio, and that's one of 100%. the ones. 
that's on your plate. You want to do Slim's Cafe. Are there any other from that era that you're, you know, really, you know, gnawing at the what? What? What's the phrase you want to say? Nipping at ch- the ch- champing at the bit. Ch- yeah, chomping at the bit. I think it's a champing, chomping, whatever. Chomping, well, I would I, say, uh, I mean, you guys did Atlanta. You know I'm a big, big fan of Atlanta 94. That's one of my favorites. Um, Indio, as you mentioned, Soldier Field is great. I would say, I mean, this one we're going to do today is right at the top of the list. I think, what's the other one I was going to say? Uh, it just slipped my mind. Um Ugh, I can't. I can't think of it now. Of course, but uh, I mean, there's there's so many. I mean, I, I you know you could go on and on. I mean, a lot of those early Europe '92 shows, like we did Zurich, is a great one. Um, what was the one I just had in my? Oh, I, I I don't know if this is maybe it's not as in the same realm, obviously anymore. But '96, you have that Deutschland Hall show, that German show. Oh, that's uh, on our list. November of '96 is a great one. Yeah, that's um, on our list. Yeah. Uh, how about New Year? Did you guys do New Year's? Uh, you and Matt, did you guys end up doing New Year's? Uh, not 91 into 92, but 92 into 93 with a quick speed wash? We did. And that is actually, for all you Patreon listeners out there, that is an exclusive ep- episode on Patreon. So if that's something that you want to listen to, go ahead and subscribe to our Patreon. Thank you, Buckley. You're already number one co-host of the day. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to get people to get over to Patreon, right? There yeah. we go. Um, Good plug. Yeah, so, uh, I mean obviously in our first year and we're we're about a month away from our one year anniversary and i've always said that you've kind of been our first or one of our first fans i actually have to give our first fandom to the person that is going to join us in a second uh but you were one of the first people that i didn't know beforehand that had saw this on uh, one of the Pearl Jam pages that had joined the page, and then we kind of got in touch with you. Do you remember, like, when when you saw it and what your reaction was? Or yeah, was it just I think free you. No, I mean, well, what could I say? That was that might have been part of it, but uh, I think you had posted in the Facebook group, right, that you were starting the podcast and that you were trying to get people or maybe it was just the the fenway group because that was where we had the big meetup and everything um, i posted a lot at, of places i still do at cask and flag the, the, the big meetup i i believe it was that was the reason you guys were broadcasting live you know showing yourself um making your t-shirts and ah. the stickers and the all the different little knickknacks that you guys were bringing to the show beforehand. I remember just seeing that and you, you had given a little bit of a description saying, Oh, you know, we're from long Island and you know, from New York and we're, if you're around, you know, if you're familiar with us, you might know where we're from, et cetera. And I was like, Oh, of course. I mean, that's where I am. And you know, what am I going to do? I see Pearl jam. I see long Island. I see <laughs> Fenway park. I'm like, all right, there we go. I, I, I got to see what's going on here. So um yeah i didn't didn't really take long for me to to reach out i remember i would always comment on the live videos and everything so yeah it was it was pretty pretty quick and we be- we've become good friends from there and we've been to last exit shows together and Absolutely. Mets games together and yep. uh yep. pearl jam brings people together and sure does. speaking of bringing people together i want to bring somebody else into uh into this and make this a trio uh, and it is uh, one of our Patreon donors, and I would like to call him officially Live on Four Legs' first fan, even though I did know him at the time. <laughs> um, but there, it's it's special, and I, I bring this up every time he comes on because there would be no Live on Four Legs if there were no Pearl Jam Fantasy League. And Bradley was such a huge part in getting that up and getting that together that... Uh, uh, he's here now and he's, you know, still, st- still been a friend ever since. So we introduced to the podcast, uh, first time since January. It's been a while. Bradley Piasecki. How you doing, bud? Hey guys. How you doing? We're doing What's great. Up, Bradley? We're ready to do this. Pink pop 92. Yeah, I'm glad to, I'm glad to be back. Yeah. And, uh, look, I keep saying it. Grand Rapids. If you haven't listened to the Grand Rapids episode yet, go and listen to that yeah. because it's just, it's listen to the boot first the show itself is incredible yeah it's just just the stories from it and you know everything that going on outside of it it, it's so unsuspecting that 
it just I don't know how it doesn't get its its due in Pearl Jam live lore. But today we're gonna get some we're gonna get to something that does get its due. Uh, oh yeah, kind of maybe maybe to some people it's 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 overdone. Maybe it's no. it's outplayed. Maybe it's out, it's overshared. Can we say that? Mm. Now here's the thing: when I say overshared, it's not like you can't see this too many times but it's always the people that are just like wow i found this and it's like um it it, it's pink pop 92 everybody knows what this is well i think if you're a newer fan and you're first discovering the band then it's natural because that's 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 the nature of how the show is and it's like you said i mean that's the lore of the show among the fan base so if you're a newer fan you're going to stumble across this of course because Because, of course, because it's that good. So people, I think, at first are in awe of how incredible the videos are. And it's, you know, you just get such a close, up-close view of the band at such a raw, young stage, early stage of their career that, to this point, you didn't really have outside of Unplugged a couple months beforehand. So this is uh, that next step in really connecting, I think, the band to an, a larger scale audience and really as we were talking about before it's like a tipping point so to speak on the rising of the movement the rising of the popularity of the band it's putting them in living rooms across really across the world but i mean really in europe uh, i mean the show of course is in the netherlands but um you know it's putting vhs tapes bootleg copies of this show that was broadcast on dutch television in, in people's houses all over the place. So it, it's like I said, I think it's a tipping point and really that next big, big step in getting them uh, to the level of popularity that they had in 93, 94, 95, where they're the biggest band, band of the world, really. It almost goes down as somewhat of a, I don't say a legendary show, but it was very widely known. And even when I first was getting into them and, um, you know, looking up YouTube clips and things like that, I would always stumble upon different songs and uh, from the show and everything. And um, in fact, it was kind of funny because I don't think I watched the show from start to finish until earlier this year, but I'd probably seen each song individually numerous times just in searching different things on YouTube and catching them, you know, just one song at a time. So, um, so it was really exciting right. to go back and just go, you know, run through them all right in order and like the whole show. And it's really one of the, it's really one of those shows that just if you're just searching Pearl Jam live on YouTube and you just want something live, it's probably in your first uh, couple that pop up. It, it's it definitely one hundred and ten percent is yeah. yeah it absolutely is especially alive in black. Those are the two uh, highlight say, performances. I mean maybe I not porch porch is up yep. there because of the stage dive and everything but i i think just because of the emotional nature of both of those performances of those two songs that and the way it's documented and it's like i said it's so close and personal and you can see the look on eddie's face and all the guys in the band it's it, it's a new taste uh, you know a new vibe and feel for these songs that people probably didn't have uh, until this point and it, it it stands the test of time it really does i mean just i'll just make one more little point here i mean i became a fan of them in 2010 so that was my first show so i was 15 turning 16 i actually when like i said was a newer fan discovering them and look going on youtube searching for videos searching for bootlegs etc this was the first show that I came across where I was like, wow, I, I really, I was like, this, this is just, uh, you know, hard to put into words how incredible this is. I, I think I still have it in my possession. I think it's in my room. I went online somewhere and I found a file of the, of the entire performance and I actually burnt it to a DVD and would watch it constantly. I mean, just constantly over and over and over again, every week I was watching this, just putting it on and just putting it on in the background and be like doing, you know, homework in high school with this thing playing in the background because it was just that good. It's the kind of show where it's short, it's sweet, but it packs the most powerful punch imaginable for the band at this stage in their career, which is really, I mean, the nature of a lot of their early shows, but this one really stands out. I mean, this is like a plus 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 energy and enthusiasm off the charts for them so 
and I just 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 going to show just goes to show you like I, I mean I became obsessed with it right out of the gate as as a new fan. So and this is something we we had talked about this the three of us before hitting record and we said you know, how how can we do this without the visual aspect and it's going to be incredibly difficult because the visual like if if you want and if you think the timing is right watch watch it as we're talking about it i don't i don't know if that's gonna uh hinder any of what we're doing but um you know or just watch it before you start listening to the actual episode or after uh because you really kind of need those visuals um to really get the feel of what's going on here to really get the energy on stage to really get the feel of the crowd and and it was rainy, it was muggy, it was dirty, and, you know, it's just kind of, again, like another sign of a generation, Generation X, uh, you know, a sign of that time, and how people were taking in music, and really, to me, it was probably the most important era of music since around Woodstock, uh, to me, because that's, you're really growing, kind of like how you know, the British invasion and, you know, not just the Beatles, but the Stones and the Who, and then later Pink Floyd and Led Zeppelin, uh, uh, you know, all those major British bands were, you know, just flocking the rock and roll charts. This was all the Seattle grunge time. Uh, You know, Nirvana was right around this time. Soundgarden was getting really popular. Alice in Chains being really popular at this time too. And every, all four of them are in the thick of it. They're all massive. Yeah, they're they're all massive. And, you know, it's funny because we were talking in the car the other day and just about how uh, those bands get lumped together and like other bands that were in the era like a stone temple pilots or right. live you know that would have the same kind of sound don't get lumped in with them because they're not from seattle right but it's all a part of the same era of music uh, yeah. but they're not but they're not they're definitely not the same i mean you listen i mean i love stp and you listen to core and it's extremely grunge. I mean, Incredibly. The, the riffs and just but his vocal, Los Angeles you know, Wyland's vocals yeah. are extremely Eddie esque, and but that but at the same time, they were already a band too. So they they didn't know who Pearl Jam was. I mean, it, maybe it's just a, a product of the time. It was just to have that kind of deep guttural, low, you know deep voice uh, it, but it's not to say that they're all the, they're all the same i think it's just the generic style of grunge slash alternative rock music how whatever t- you know title name you want to call it it was just a product of the time it, that that's what was in that was what was popular that was the movement of the time like you said randy like the 60s this is 30 years later it's this same thing in the 90s now so I think it's just, like I said, it's just a product of that time and that period of music. Yeah, I think a lot, a lot of it has to do with. Um, sadly enough, grunge is kind of more of a fashion statement than it is a type of music. Because when you think grunge, you think plaid, you think you know torn up jeans, you think long hair, you think kind of the unkempt Seattle look. Sure, uh, we could just go with Seattle scene. Don't forget the Doc Martin boots, right? The Docs, yes, of course. Yeah, of course. But, you know, that that's that sort of plays into the whole thing and why those four bands really stood out, you know, being from Seattle, being that scene. But, you know, we can go on and on and on about that. Um, I think we need to get back to the focus, and that's really on what was going on in the time period for the band themselves um, right. starting to really get popular. And this is kind of, I think you said it before, this was – You know, this aided their popularity at a time where they were just about to hit their stride. Uh, Jeremy wasn't a music video yet. Uh, It was probably two or three months later that it would become a music video. And I really feel like that was the the point where they got pushed over the edge because of how uh, big that music video was, how important that music video was. Right. as far as a standpoint of getting them out in the open, getting them uh, in front of exposure, people. Exposure, yeah, just exposure. getting them exposure. 
This was in front of 60,000 people. They had not played a show in front of that many people before that. That that was Well, that's what he says. The largest and he says crowd. that. And yeah. I actually have I had some backup on that because uh a couple weeks or months ago Dave A on his Facebook page posted something uh, that had a, a pink pop clip in it or a picture of pink pop. And I actually commented and I said, was this the biggest show that you had done at, at that time? And uh, he clicked like, so I, I'm going to guess he agreed with that <laughs> statement. So uh, that, that, that's better than We'll nothing. accept that answer. Yeah. Yeah, at least he acknowledged you. Exactly. exactly. Uh, but, hey, pretty cool that... You know, Dave A kind of knows. I, I think he knows what the podcast is. Uh, so that's something to kind of throw in there. Hi. Yeah. If Dave, Dave, if you're listening, hi. Uh, Come on the show. love to have you on for an episode yeah. someday. Let's, let's, let's chat sometime. Did um, you guys ever see just talking about the size of the crowd? And I think it's just, it, this is a good little tidbit to add here. Have you ever seen the post show interview? Of the Dutch like reporter with, with Eddie. I feel like I have. It, I think it might be on YouTube. I don't know. I, I'm pretty sure. Because at the well, end... You, they, show it, they show it in PJ20, I believe, don't they? Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, I think the only experience I have with it is from the PJ20 movie. I don't. I haven't sought it out on my own on YouTube or anywhere else, but... I have the MP3 in my, in my iTunes library. I honestly don't remember where I got it from, but it's about five minutes long. And it's just the reporter asking him. Tell me, you look quite mixed up. Look at these pictures. I'll show you these pictures. I'll show you why I feel the way I do. It's a little bit overwhelming to see this many people. I mean, I'm sure you've been looking at this all day. There's a lot of people. (laughs) We're used to playing small clubs, you know. And he, he's just, like, basically crying, essentially, <laughs> over the <laughs> fact that they just played for tens of thousands of people. It just goes to show you that this was uh, impactful, not just on their career, but on them personally. This had a really profound impact on them. I mean, that goes back to our conversation that we had in the Zurich episode. Um, right. That they played the Volkshaus or Rockhaus, whatever it was. Volkshaus. Uh, Volkshaus. Uh, and they didn't even have room on the stage for their equipment that's how small clubs they were playing and that was only what that was in february and this is in june that's four or five months that that's like that's going from you know from nothing from rags to riches in almost no time at all and i mean they're only playing like 45 minutes even soundgarden you know they're playing the same show I think both bands, even though they're incredibly popular at this point, uh, maybe like we said, still on the rise, so to speak. They haven't. This is they're at that just before the moment where they truly, truly explode. Th- they're only playing forty-five minutes. I mean, it's a short set. Granted, it's a festival, but I mean, these are two huge bands at the well, time. I'm pretty sure and, and Talking Heads are the headliner, right? I think so. Yeah, David Byrne. Yeah, was, he talks about David Byrne. And, yeah, yep. yeah. I thought David, I was gonna say I think David Byrne was the headliner that night. I think I've I've seen the listing on that before, and Soundgarden was at the bottom of the bill, and then there were bands in front of Pearl Jam and Soundgarden. Maybe they were just like popular in Europe, but you guys want to hear something really funny? Because I just what? googled Pink Pop '92 just to see who else played. You know who else played? Buffalo Tom. Oh, oh yeah, you're right. Oh. How about that? You're right. Yeah. Little Fenway uh, 2018 tidbit. That's pretty Very cool. Interesting. That is. It looks like The Family Stand, The Cult, Soundgarden, a Dutch folk band by the name of Rowan Hees. Rowan Hazy. <laughs> uh, PJ like Harvey. Vi- Viking Core. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Lou Reed, David Byrne, Buffalo Tom, Pearl Jam, and a dutch another dutch band hollow venray yeah hmm. so it's like that's not very a, eclectic yeah yeah it's not a bad bill at all like look you got some legends in there lou reed and david byrne and pj harvey like there's a lot yeah there's there's a lot there for everybody so let's let's, let's dig get into, into this it. but before sure. we get into the music since this is a very visual show we have to get into our fashion report <laughs> 
Ed is sporting a brown corduroy jacket at first. Takes it off. Woo, backwards woo, hat. And has the black backwards hat, black shorts, and the absolutely famous Tivoli shirt. That yes. uh, does not I have a copy of it. I'm not ashamed. Hey, you know what? It's part <laughs> of history. Uh, Dave A. behind the kid is, is sporting some kind of black shirt. It looks like there's some skulls or some wheels or something on it. I couldn't tell. Uh, Jeff, signature bandana, starting off with a, a black long sleeve shirt. He would go on to take that off into a purple tank top, a very, you know, 19, a very 1992, you know, <laughs> probably basketball court kind of thing to wear. Uh, he has all the basketball figurines on the base amp. Yep. Base head. Mm-hmm. And uh, the incense going as well. Oh, yeah. Uh, cargo shorts and Nikes for Jeff. Uh, Stone. You know, this. I, I'm going to get into it. With stone stone fashion. Bit. Can I just say something as a side note? We Please should do. have an episode all about stone fashion. I, I think that's fantastic. We could probably do an entire separate podcast just on stone fashion. I, I think that is something um we can we can do it now we can do it tomorrow uh it it is something we can do like we're gonna do the the evolution episodes of uh you know how songs evolved throughout time uh we can do an evolution of stone 100 percent, and just just fashion not just it, correct me if i'm wrong did he wear a yellow turtleneck with a cowboy hat and sandals once I, and shorts i think he did uh <laughs> Was that the 10th anniversary <laughs> I would not show? Be surprised. It, I'm not sure what show it was, but I remember seeing that image. The one that sticks out to me is the David Letterman. Uh, oh, yeah, the, with the orange? The orange, yep. The yep. orange uh, polo sh- or rugby shirt, whatever that was. And he, uh, he looks like a creamsicle <laughs> or a highlighter <laughs> or something like that. He had shorts and then a, uh, an orange beanie as well, I think. He That's, looks very typical uh, 90s stone in this one, though. Very, very, um, like a, a bunch of the other shows that you'd see him in in the early going. And then it's after this, once they start to grow, is where his, his fashion tastes begin to expand and become that, growingly more bizarre. <laughs> That's one of my comments in this is just how did Stone go from, like, cool-looking, f- popular Goatee, band guitarist, long hair, long hair to, like, Total nerd that does his little duck wing strum. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> the little duck wing thing that he does. Yep. Like, when when does this transformation happen? Because it's just, it, it's so, I don't know. Like, it, it feels like in this point in time, like, he's somebody that is cool. And then he turns into, like, a total geek. <laughs> I don't but know. a geek you want to hang out with. Oh, yeah. He's he's a he's a nerd with a lot of musical groove, so yeah, we'll take um, it. I believe he's wearing a Muhammad Ali shirt. I couldn't tell. I believe he is as well. Yeah, I couldn't tell what it says. Uh, and then finally, rounding out with Mike Fashion Soundgarden T-shirt that says something like uh, "Don't eat yeah. meat" or something on the back. On the back, it says "Louder than meat." Louder than meat. Okay. Yeah, louder than meat, and then on the something. front it says so, there's some sort of phrase underneath where it says Soundgarden, and there's like a picture in the middle. It's hard to make out. I'd have to watch the video, but obviously not going to do that. Right yeah, now, but... it, it was it was diff- it was difficult to see. He is sporting a leather jacket uh, during, in the beginning. In the beginning, and that's that's where we start here. Uh, it, it cuts right in, and and you know, um, I, I wonder where. The footage is if there's any footage at all or how this all came about but this someone would have unearthed it by now you would think yeah. this starts and if if that that's you can't find any versions of even flow out there uh you know this is something like bradley if, if you were you said you would watch every individual clip you probably never saw the even flow clip because it's only 40 right. seconds long it's just the end of the song so this this kicks off with Ed on the scaffold, and they're just about done with the bridge and getting back into the chorus. Our own life, but a 
is kind of he's like doing his little like head rush thing and and he's got the backwards mm-hmm. hat on he's like sort of slowly climbing off but i really man i don't think there there are a lot of people out there that are like pearl jam lifers that and obviously you know it, it's the main base is is american but um there's got to be somebody out there that went to the show and if there there is Please, live on four legs podcast at gmail.com. You have to get in touch with us. You have to tell us about your experience there because I'm sure once in a lifetime. I would love to know. Yeah. How, how did he get on the scaffold? That, that's, that's question number one. Someone out there knows. They have to. They have to. Um, you know, there's nothing really much on even flow aside from, you know, him uh jumping off the scaffold and doing the final chorus there uh it's the crowd is massive and i think the weather's usually disgusting the weather is awful you i don't know if it's mist or if they're like clouds of dust or dirt and rain all, right yeah I, I i'm not sure what the mixture is there but it's uh it's Definitely, it, it is it is a mess. But um, one of the things that that perks perks up to me is just how energetic Jeff is in the early going. Yes, and he's wearing the knee brace, I mm-hmm. think, as well, which is another little fashion tidbit we could throw in there. And <laughs> he, I, 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 what can you say? It's just the video says it all. You just watch it, and they're just jumping around like crazy. And I mean, every guy in the band even you know dave is just grooving really hardcore behind the drum set and the energy level is just 10 million percent off the charts just from the beginning to the end non-stop movement jeff's on the ground at multiple times and <laughs> well not stones, on purpose like jumping around a little bit and they're 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 in peak 90 early 90s pj energy level here totally feeding off the energy of the crowd from the first note all the way to the end yeah my notes pretty much say the same thing i just commented on how uh how much energy they all seem to have and they you know they they got the crowd into it right away and i think uh for a festival show this was a a good choice as an opener because it i'm sure it got everybody into it like i said right away Mm mm-hmm Exactly, and this song I'm sure was already well known to everybody there. It's the big hit at this point, like you said, Randy. Jeremy has still not really reached its uh, popularity peak, I guess we could say, by this point in time. So Even Flow is the one that they know. Festival, let's come right out, give it to them right away. We'll we'll get everybody moving. And exactly, Bradley, you know, it's a perfect choice for for the situation. It's it's smart because too at the at the time uh, they were uh, most shows opening with an oceans or a release you know that you know still to this day is the common trend that they would do and and really when you look at and I've been listening to other festivals lately um, they've been coming right out of the gate with stuff like corduroy with stuff like go uh, with stuff like our next song that we're about to hear why go. Uh, and that's really, that's the way to do it. That's the way to capture the crowd. If they were to start off with release, the crowd would have just kind of not known what to do with themselves. They would have stood yeah. there. The only I, low, quote unquote low energy song in this entire set is black. black. Right. Like, not to spoil it, but <laughs> everybody it's knows. Not it. I mean, it's not really a spoiler. I mean, everybody knows uh, it, it. That's the only song here. Honestly, of the ten, what is it? Ten songs that that you could really say is <laughs> a bit of a break, a respite from the jumping around like maniacs. So yeah, I was gonna say like I know when I see them, I I prefer the slow burn opener, but like at a festival, you know, I I totally get it. They want to get everybody into it right away, and they kind of I assume they want to use a hit just because there's probably a good chunk of people there that aren't there just for them. There's people who are there just to see Lou Reed or just to see um, Soundgarden or whoever, and they might not be that familiar with them. So I think, you know, kicking off with something that they probably would recognize is a good way to get people, like, uh, engaged right away. Absolutely. That gets us into, man, you talk about energy. You talk about just just going out and grabbing it by the throat uh why go is absolutely incredible in this early spot
I think when at least especially from Eddie's perspective, I mean to be standing there in front of sixty thousand people, seeing them all saying, Hey, 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 back to him it, it's and I, I feel like we can't understate enough how impactful this concert is again just for, like on a personal level for them to, to be going from club shows where they can ba- barely fit like we said their yeah. gear on a riser to then seeing this sea of faces in a country that they're not even from singing and, and just going nuts along with them that I think has a lasting impression I mean he, he we've seen these Polaroids that Mike has taken that Eddie has taken from the show and it's clear that they have never forgotten that moment. I think that just to even connect it again in 2018 when they went back and played, it was extremely evident with Eddie wearing right. a Tavoli shirt. And again, they played it in 2000 and he was wearing the shirt and he meets the cameraman again. And it, it, it's it, obviously there is a connection here. They are very, very mindful and a uh, conscious and aware of the fact that this was a moment in time for them in their career and as musicians, individual musicians that had a lasting impression. This whole show is bigger than the performances themselves. It's really, again, go watch everything as we're talking about it after or before. Uh, and you really get the feel for it. I would, I would guess that probably 90% of the people listening to this have seen this at least once or twice or 5,000 times. So, uh, <laughs> Go watch it 5,000 more if you have to. Uh, you can hear in between here. Um, now it's, Rain. It's, yeah. Uh, you can hear Mike noodling a little bit. And yeah. does it sound to you? Oh. Uh, what, what do you think I was going to say? No, yeah, I was going to ask the same thing. I made a note that to me it sounded like they started playing the, uh, the first couple of notes of Hard to Imagine. Yeah. They were well. They were known for that in the beginning. Um, right. I think a lot of these early '90s shows before Hard to Imagine became more of a widespread, well-known rarity. <laughs> it was a rarity from the start, but before everyone really knew what it was, they would tease it. Uh, Stone would play the opening. It was an improv lick riff. There, it's like an improv that yeah. became a song and. I think that's an ex- early, ex- another early example of them kind of, you know, Mike's just kind of, like you said, noodling around, messing around for a second. But, you know, they're short on time. They don't have time for any uh, lengthy improvs like they do in some of their other shows at, at the clubs and everything like this. So uh, Eddie doesn't take long to launch into Jeremy. But, um, yeah, cool little tidbit there, yeah. But that's not uh, before Ed gives a little line from uh, the Beatles song Rain. Right. Um, which, again, you go back to the throwbacks, uh, the callbacks. Uh, they played doing, it in 2018, right? They played it 2018 and 2016 in... Uh, in London? Wrigley. A uh, Wrigley. Wrigley. Right. Yeah, Ed singing Rain and then uh, calling out the next song called Jeremy. Um it's sticking out here because it's right before they hit it big. Like I said before, it, this is this is right before Jeremy became a hit song. So the crowd is familiar with it if they have 10, but they're not as familiar as they they would be in the next couple of months. This is not yet big, but this sounds big this sounds like they are preparing for this to be their next big hit yeah right like they took extra care to really give a a strong effort on this song not that they wouldn't have anyway but it's it's a top-notch performance i I love the ending Which again, as as we've you guys have already discussed and we've talked about, it's it's you know worth watching the videos for most of these songs here, and, right. and you'll you'll see. But uh, was, yeah, I just he just seemed very like full of energy and full. You know, he's like I said, animated for during the song. 
He's got those eyes going when he does the, ah, the crazy ah, eyes. Like, yes, yeah, he's he's got crazy eyes a couple times in this show, and that's really that is worth the watch, uh, if anything at all. Uh, but again, gotta love those clouds of dirt, dust, mist, whatever it is, just hovering across the crowd at that time. It gets bigger and bigger as the show goes on. So smoke, uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it absolutely could be smoke, actually. <laughs> Yeah. I should have I think said that's that a pretty first good before guess. everything else. <laughs> With it being legal where they are. Right. Um, so after Jeremy, technically, we're supposed to get deep. There's no video footage deep. No one really knows why. Uh, at least I haven't been able to figure out, and it's not something that people have really been asking the question about because when they see the show, they don't necessarily go back to the set list and see – what the set list looked like because there's only nine ten songs so they wouldn't be thinking anything would be missing but deep is not here so really in in the way that the video goes it goes from jeremy into ed uh addressing the crowds you survived today no matter what band could come up here this thing wouldn't happen without you you're the whole reason that this thing is even halfway a success it's you surviving the rain. It's you who's going to be sick tomorrow. It's you who we appreciate. Thank you. At this point of watching, and this is more of a technical aspect of how it's shot, like from no other show that we've watched from like you know any other dvd from the live at the garden dvd from touring band stuff from most other shows there's no other show that shot as intimately as this show is it feels some of those shots especially the ones way behind dave a it makes the stage feel so huge uh the shot the shots on the sides uh next to stone the shot next to mike um they almost never give you a front view of the whole entire stage it's it's either a really tight close-up of eddie or it's one of those other shots that i mentioned there and it makes you feel like you're it's so intimate like you're on the stage the whole entire time you know why that might be and that's actually a good point I never really thought about that but now you have me thinking i it's probably because it is so early in their career and they are so young and it is a festival where they're not in a position to say, Oh, we'd prefer you stay back a little bit. We don't, right. you know, they don't control it. They're not in control of the recording and the videotaping of their performance. It's the festival and the TV station or whoever that's broadcasting this, that's coordinating and is running this entire operation. So they're not going to be able, they're just not in a position at this point to be like, hey, listen, like, we really don't want cameras up on stage with us while we're playing. Same thing with Soundgarden. You ever, if you ever watch the performance, Cornell's flipping off the camera in yeah. its face when the camera is like right next to him. So right. it just goes to show you they probably didn't want it that way, but they also don't have the leverage and the, uh, the, the clout at this point in their career to really make that request and be like, Listen, we, we, we can we do it our way? Like we'd really prefer you kind of stay back. We don't really want this to be done like this. But then obviously as time goes by, it it kind of changes and things aren't as up close and personal over time. You know what I mean? Yeah, that makes sense. I never actually really thought about it, but that makes perfect sense. I just think from a directing standpoint, it was it was just a job well done. Whoever the director of this performance was, or or even the whole entire time, just the way that the cameras were positioned, it's it's really not a way that you get to see bands nowadays and i I wish that we would go back to that because it it does feel kind of homemade in a way and it feels kind of raw in a way that's what i was noticing during a live like a lot of these shots are real quick shots of just everybody emotional and energetic and running all over the stage um you have ed smashing the mic at the end uh and he's screaming his yes and he's screaming back to the crowd that's that's a really important 
moment in the show right here. He's like beating his chest, not beating mm-hmm. his chest, but like kind of like t- tapping his chest as he's doing it, really, really in sync with the rhythm of the song. Like, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> The video speaks for itself. Uh, I, I don't even need to say anything more than that. The video speaks for itself. So when, if you're a fan, even if you're not a fan, you watch that. Just t- listen to that. Tell me you're not into it. Uh, you're, you're, if you tell me you're not, you're a liar. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, my notes pretty much just say I enjoyed Eddie going nuts on stage because he was he was just, you know, he was great. This was him, I say it all the time, ch- channeling his inner Pete. Uh, you know, breaking wants to smash guitars and smash mic stands and, and really, you know, it's going off of whatever energy that the crowd has given back to him. He's saying, well, look, I got something for you, too. I got something that, that you can remember this show by. And and this version of Alive was definitely, it's one that, that sticks out. Uh, Plus the War Pigs tag at the end. The War Mike. Pigs tag. Yep, yeah, that's uh, absolutely. Um, they and, and they'll go back to that, too. That's another thing that, the, that they'll go back to sometimes. Sure. Very Definitely. subtly. Yeah, I was going to say. Very, very subtly. My, the first time I listened to it, or I should say the first time I re-listened to it, I didn't I didn't even catch up or catch the War Pigs tag. And then when I on Live Footsteps, when I saw, I was like, oh, and I went back and listened. And then I, you know, since I knew what I was listening for, I was able to catch it. But, but it was very subtle the first time. Or for me, it was anyways. All right, so it goes from Alive into Black. And I think all the energy that Alive had, I think you need kind of a little bit of a cool down um Mm -hmm. you're really going really heavy with the first four or five black is really you know stabilizing a little bit it's kind of giving the crowd a little bit of a breather while still feeling the same sorts of energy and and sort of emotion just in a different fashion Um, especially for eddie too it's still this is another emotional performance from him and from mike as well I, I would say Stone doing the backup vocals on this is is fantastic. Is this uh, the is this the frame in the in the uh, broadcast where Stone is looking at Eddie while he's singing and he's just looks so like mystified and in <laughs> awe of Eddie as he's singing. I love that. So funny. If you if you pause it, I think it's during one of the I think it's during one of the verses. You could see Stone's face in the background, just like with his eyes like half closed, like looking at Eddie while he's singing. It's so funny. We'll yeah, have to it, find the screenshot. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's um, yeah. This is. I mean, it was all fun and games before this. Then you go into this, and it's it's heavy hitting stuff. Uh, the we belong together tag. It really starts to ramp up. The crowd really starts to get into it, and you can really start to feel. The passion there. I wish I had a dollar for every time I've watched this video of this <clears throat> performance of Black. Um, it is easily, easily, it pro- I would have to say it's probably in my top 10 all-time performances of not just Black of any Pearl Jam song, I would say. Yeah, That's incredible. No, it was, it was very good. Yeah, I can't, it's hard to argue with that. Stone is dancing in this. That's what I wrote <laughs> in my notes. I don't... I don't uh, necessarily remember writing that, but um, I'm not sure why he was dancing the way he did. Um, why does Stone ever dance the way he does? <laughs> well, I don't does question he wear, it. I just enjoy it. Why does he wear yellow shirts and cowboy hats? That's, I don't know. I want to ask him. Stone, if you're uh, listening, come on. <laughs> wait, what is that? What is that? Um, he says uh, you can have a coffee mug. Would you yeah. like a coffee mug? <laughs> he wants some coffee. <laughs> Uh, drop the leash, drop the leash, get out of my fucking face. This is the angry youth anthem, uh, that has been come to expect it at this time. Um, obviously a year before Verses came out, uh, but intensity, passion, 
all of these songs, and and this is just even though there's less of a familiarity with it, I, I would think that bootlegs are probably sparse at that time. That fans are just kind of playing off the energy and playing off what they hear. But uh, boy, was, was was this good and was this a special version? Yeah, it was, I yeah. thought it was very good. Yeah, I it's hard to believe this was the. I guess this is right. The forty seventh time they had already played Leash. Yeah, at this Leash point. had been Leash debuted, I think, early ninety one. If November I no, November ninth, nineteen ninety one. Wow. They close. They closed with it at Bender Arena in Washington D.C. Wow. Yeah, you know, I was looking up something too, just because out of curiosity, because I also found it interesting that it was the forty seventh time, because it says it only been, it's only been played one hundred and thirty times. Well, I went and looked when the album was released, and so by the time the album was released. They had already played it 68 of the 130 times. So more than half That's the times crazy. they played it was before the album was actually released. And that was 26 yeah. years ago. Now. Right. Yeah, well, coming, yeah. coming up on 26 years since the album's been released. So yeah. clearly they they had kind of had their fill of it. And it's also hard to sing, I think. And it definitely doesn't have the same kind of uh, flair to it these days that it did back then. And I think that has yeah. a lot to do with the – just them being older now, more mature. Oh, this sure. is like you said, Randy. It's like that, you know, like anti-establishment youth anthem of mm-hmm. the time. So I think that has a lot to do with it. But this pers- specific performance is definitely one of the. I mean, every song really is like a highlight for the show. But yeah. the, another perfect example of the energy uh, on display here in the, at Pink Pop for sure. Stop, please. Stop, please. But it just goes to show you how how the dynamic of Leash has changed over time from this point. Like, and that's actually that's a um, that is a great point, uh, Bradley, with the fact that it, they they had already played it what sixty eight times when Versus had come out. So it's just right. I think that's a really interesting stat. That's really cool. Yeah, and they played it less than sixty eight times since it's come out. So Unreal. It's just insane, insane. Yeah. Um, that gets us into once, and if you remember the Zerk show, Ed's doing the whole, I'm not crazy, I'm not crazy, and once upon a time, goes right into it, does the same thing at this, and the Zerk show is, uh, I want to say 10 days after Pink Pop, I think Zerk was the 18th, this is the 8th, right. so he's doing a lot of the same stuff at uh, at the time, so it's kind of cool to see that he's keeping consistency here. Mm-hmm. Um, Jeff lost his base at some point. It came off the strap. He's running around and swinging it in circles. Um, I don't know what he's doing, but Jeff is is the MVP on stage. With all of what Eddie is doing in this show, Jeff seems to be like the energy MVP. Mm-hmm. Yep, I know exactly he, what. Yep, and I, I totally agree. Even though Ed is doing everything he does, but what Ed is, you know, Ed is doing par for the course Ed kind of stuff for 1992. Jeff is just, he's kind of putting a little peer pressure into Ed being like, I'm, <laughs> I'm really going buck wild here. What He was you feeling got? some type of way that day yeah. for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, it's really, again, this song visuals the insane eyes that he gives you it can happen to me it can happen to you uh or i don't even uh i don't even think it was that i think it was i got something to say yeah i got the, something to the, prove. the other the other one you're thinking of is that was the zurich show that was volk's yeah. house yeah yeah, yeah 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 uh but th- it's just the eyes it's him being locked in at the time and feeding off the power that's coming from that stage I honestly don't have anything to add because, again, for the one millionth time, it is the visual of just seeing him stay locked in for the full, 
show and just the connection he's feeling and, and just so in the zone. So, so in the moment, in the zone, feeling it. Everything is just perfect about his performance in the show. And just another example of a song that is not easy to sing, requires a lot of energy, is uh, all a little all over the place as, as far as like the vocal parts and he nails it. He just absolutely nails it. I mean, what else is new, you know? Yeah. Along with everything else that has that we've talked about and everything else that we're about to talk about, it's kind of it's almost paling in comparison in a way. Like, you know, a live black porch that's coming up, the pulled up tags that's coming up. Uh once I don't want to say it's forgotten about, but it's like with everything else, it's it's just sort of it's it's like the lettuce. Uh, and not the meat or the cheese. It, it's of like the, lettuce or of the pearl maybe jam burger. Tomato. Yeah, maybe maybe it's a tomato. Who knows? Uh, but you know, it, it, it is it is sticking like good glue, though. Um, that gets us into Ed talking again. He says, "Never played for the in front of this many people before. So many clean people sanitized by the rain." <laughs> Never played with David Byrne. So weird. Hopefully we'll, hopefully we'll play with Soundgarden. They're kind of like always... friends or something. Yeah. yeah <laughs> and then uh, this is interesting. We always talked about if we moved from Seattle, we'd move to Holland. That's, uh, I mean, and I Is he just why. saying that? I, I, the, you look at him in the way he's saying it. He he's seems like, pretty earnest. Yeah, he seems yeah. pretty sincere he does. about it. Yeah. If it's for more than the, the weed, then... Who knows? But what about what about that story with that girl, the bicycle girl? You guys heard that that yes. ca- uh, come back around, yes, right? Yes, I did. Yes. Was that before this show or after? That was in I want to say the spring of this year, right? Wasn't it, was just, it? So, yeah, it was one of the Eddie solo shows, I thought. Right. The solo show was just a few weeks right, ago. Right, right. Little... Like what was yeah. it? Like Mid late May. But you're talking about the original show. Yeah, yeah, the one that he where he met the girl. Where he met her. Uh let me let me try to find that really quick. Hang on. Yeah, cuz I mean, if you haven't seen the story, it's it's an it's an amazing story about how Ed had this uh connection with this girl uh that took him home on a bike and he had her brother's sweater or something like that. Yeah, um, so you you know what's funny? It was the Tavoli Utrecht show uh, in 1992. Oh, how okay. about that? How yeah. about that? So what was the date from that? So it's the actual article, this is from June 24th, 2019. So he was in his show um, in Amsterdam, June 9th, about. Yep, yeah, and there's the picture. There they are. That's crazy. If, if you have not, if you're listening to this and you have not read the article, j- just Google it. I actually, just to, just to tell you, I Googled Pearl Jam Holland Bike Woman. <laughs> <laughs> That's and enough, it, yeah. And it came up, and it came up. Uh, yeah. All right, let's see. 92, Utrecht, Tivoli, March 4th. March 4th, there you there go. You go. There you memory. go. I'm 92. So I wonder if at this time he had the strong connection to Amsterdam, to Holland, uh, because of of a very special moment that he had. Uh, after. If you read the article, it really shot. does appear that way. Yeah. Like I, is, he seemed really into this woman at the time. Right, right. The woman was there, and I forgot about this part. The woman was only there because she was trying to see the opening act because her friends were in the band. That's right. Oh. And the yeah, name of the right. band was City Pig Unit. <laughs> <laughs> that's a fantasy team name so, for you right that's there. That's a great name. City Pig Unit. CPU. Computer. These City Dutch Pig bands, Unit. Man. Uh she offered to call him a taxi, but he asked, do you have a bike? He wanted to ride on the back. So she borrowed her brother's bike handed her, um, and handed her backpack over to him to carry. Uh, he jumped on the back. He wore her brother's red flannel shirt because it was cold and nighttime. <laughs> Again, it was March 4th. Um, she described their farewells a bit awkward, if not endearing. She gave him her address so he could return the flannel. Then they shook hands. He waved goodbye until she rode out of sight, forgetting that he was still wearing her backpack. He was so shy and modest, she said, that almost made him so nice. Also, oh, not almost. Also made him so nice. So, it says she tried over the years to reconnect with him, but 
but to, to, with no luck until this year. So really, yeah, really cool story. she was trying story. to get attention. She would go to shows and try to get attention to security guards, and it, it didn't work. And I feel like it was somebody in uh, the the string quartet that Ed was it touring was. with. Yeah, I think it was year, it was the cello player, I believe. Okay. So he he connect he connects with the the cameraman from Pink Pop in one year, and then a couple months later he's reconnecting with this woman from you know from Tivoli. It's just so cool. Uh, he has lots of strong ties to to this country, and um, you know I I didn't even have the, this was just kind of off the cuff. I didn't even have the Bicycle Girl in here, and it's such a the Tivoli it's connection Im- is perfect. Right. It's such an important story to the time. And, and you can see, like you said, in, in his face, it looks like he's earnest. And I'm wondering if he's thinking during the show, will we, will I get to see her tonight? Is she here? You yep. know, like, you know, he's, he's a rock star, but he's not, he's right. not above it. Yeah. He's very down to earth. So anyway, uh, Mike, during that little part of, First of all, Eddie says, "I'm I'm never usually this nice. I'm I'm usually pretty mean." Um, and it sounds like Mike is playing Wild Horses in the background. Did you pick up? Yes, on that? yes. Okay. Yes. I, I was listening to it. I'm like, I know this, and then I started singing this, and I'm like, oh, right, oh, Wild Horses. Okay, there we go. It's just one of those things that you have to sort of work your way through. Uh, that gets us in the porch stage dive. Uh, Man, what what do we say? It's, uh, the, honestly, it's so there's really you really don't even have to say anything uh, other than just go watch it. Right. Like of all of the things that we've said so far to go watch, if we had to, you know, gun your head, pick one song to to pick to go watch right now, this would be the one because it's stage dive to end all stage dives cameraman floating from the stage out into the crowd so he can jump off and you I'm know. so surprised that the cameraman was so just willing to let him do this right. that he wasn't like hey get off that's not safe to do that that he was like it was a different okay. time yeah yeah instead it seemed like he was just like okay how can we do this safely if you're gonna do this i'm gonna help you do here. this <laughs> right um and they kind of you can see the jib that's kind of moving towards the crowd a little bit and you can see the cameraman start to get uneasy but you know that's that is not an easy job up there by the way that that just being just being up there and you're not in control of the jib somebody else is controlling your jib on the bottom so the guy holding the camera is up there and basically he can zoom in zoom out and he has no control of what he's doing he just has to get direction in his ear to uh, who he should have a shot on so uh again ed climbs upon mike is during the solo and he kind of there's a brief pause and he wants to make sure he has everybody's attention and do this as safely as possible and then there's the dive <laughs> has been photographed everywhere. I mean, it's obviously one of the most iconic. It's one of the most incredible rock photos. Yeah. And iconic is a perfect word for it. Yeah. And, um, and they, they hold him up for, he, he dives into the crowd and they hold him up for a good couple seconds before it just kind of topples over a little bit. Um, and every, you know, Ed is, even at the time, very conscious to make sure that everybody is okay. And the people that he was on top of, he's looking at them and saying, are you good? Are you good? Are you good? And I love kind of the before and after with the Tavoli shirt there, uh, because he comes up from that and the Tavoli shirt is ripped to shreds. Yep. Just an awesome visual coming back to the stage, finishing up the song and, the crowd is all clapping in unison with him. Killer ending. Uh, it's just, it is 
as iconic as iconic can get with this band. I 100% um, the image, just the whole little sequence. It, it's it's legendary. It's flat out legendary, and it's so fun to watch every time. A little nerve wracking, even though we obviously know that everything works out just fine. But right. so amazing. So that kind of um, this is kind of a little encore section here, so to speak. I don't I don't know if what it's technically. Uh, you know, you see Jeff kind of taking some water, and he's he's resting a little bit. He's trying to catch his, his breath. Dave pretty much stays out there and he starts a little beat and um, and then Ed comes back on stage with the Polaroid camera, takes photos of the crowd. And so he starts singing into pulled up. And this is really where the crowd, he has them in his grasp here. This is like everything he's done up to this point. They are like mesmerized by everything he's doing every move he's made and he's doing the he's doing pulled up he's singing it and everybody is clapping along chanting along the beat is perfect mom and daddy come and look at me now. i'm a big man in a great big town years ago who would believe it's true goes to show a little faith can do what else could be more perfect about this <laughs> nothing really yeah that's one of my favorite parts of the whole concert honestly it show it shows the kind of performer he is and the kind of performer that he's aspiring to be he's he he wants he cares about the crowd he wants everybody to have a good time he wants to entertain and that's all number one important things in his mind and you could see in his face how much fun he's having he's forgetting you know and sometimes you go on stage and you can be like well we have some business to attend to he he sort of here forgets about the business aspect of it and uh and he's just he's going off instinct. Yeah, he he wants to connect with them and he's like I said before, he's just so in the zone and living in the moment that it, it's like it's effortless. You know what I mean? It's like he's just having so much fun yeah. uh, singing these songs that he's a fan of to a crowd with his own band behind him. It's it's just he's living the dream. Yeah, I, I was going to say this pretty much the same thing as yeah, he he reads the crowd so well and then just has fun with it. You know, you could tell like yeah, he's He's having fun. You could just you could see it. And then uh, the suggestion tag as well. Both of them together kind of go hand in hand over the years. I mean, uh, you know, pulled up was like you said was brought back at Pink Pop uh, last year. Uh, suggestion, I think. You know, this this is really something that they did back early early nineties, but they have brought it back a little bit for in te- teases or tags. Uh, in recent years, but it's still um, very rare to see, uh, and it's kind of a nod to just sort of early band and, and the stage. I would love to see them do both of these tags even more. You know, I would love for them to bring these back full time. You know, if they ever tour again, right. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. We'll see. Uh, all, you know, I'm just kidting. But in all honesty, I I, I love both of them. Um, and yeah, the same thing. Like we said for pulled up, I, it's just so cool. It, it's and it sounds like so generic, like just to call things cool yeah. and so awesome and amazing over and over again. But if you're a fan of music, if you're a fan of the band, and you just enjoy listening and it's just that's what it is it's just enjoyable to listen to and it's just such a cool experience to watch them have so much fun and play these songs at this moment in time and um i think that really just kind of segues into the to the final song which is about explosive of an an ending as you could ask for yeah um what what a way to end it rocking in the free world and this is like the zurich show this is this This is is my favorite version of a free world ever I, that I could say without a doubt. This is my number one, without a doubt, my most go-to version of Free World that they that I've ever heard them play. Oh 
shuffle in their feet People sleeping in their shoes There's a warning sign in the road ahead There's a lot of people saying we be better off dead Don't deal like a savior, cry out to them So I try to focus And Randy, we spoke so much at length about at the Zurich show the slow, mm-hmm. lumbering, you know, like almost like uh, I don't even know how to just like it sounds like a bunch of like cave people, like the, the you know the drum beat in the beginning. Like, it's kind of say like dun, a train dun. chugging along. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's just it. I love love how they draw that out until the yeah uh, you know the the ending of like that first verse i guess it would be before it really kicks in and they they kind of get going you know what i mean right yeah the, look the if it w- wasn't insane in the crowd before this is you have to watch the crowd shots in this one because there's way more of that smoke or that dust dirt mist rain whatever it is there's way more of that than there was before there's way more people that are wild that realize that this is going to be the last song of the night this is it and they are cherishing every moment of it and the band is too because i feel like the band is seeing at this point like we have to say goodbye that's really that's a shame this has been such a a good night for us a memorable night for us that we have to go out on on the most strong, the strongest foot possible, and and yep. they killed it. Only other thing I would add to that is that both of Mike's solos here are amazing, and they're amazing. Not in, they're not. He's not like really shredding. You know how like there's a lot of solos where he's just shredding his yeah. ass off. You know what I mean? This is these two solos are not really where he's you know kind of going like up and down the neck and really really just like kind of you know doing his typical you know sh- face melting kind of solo. It's a very basic but very emotional and it, it just fits very well with the performance of like this the this old style performance of free world for them and i it, it just it suits it so well where he you know he kind of like plays like one note for a really long time with the wah on and he, you know if you watch him play he's kind of like going into like hendrix territory with yep. his face you know kind of just like feeling it like staring up into the sky and just like kind of losing himself in the moment it's just uh, the, the way the to watch him play it is honestly <laughs> almost as much of a pleasure to, to listen to him play it you know I thought, you know, Mike killed it all, the whole show, and this was, you know, just a perfect way to cap it off. Sure. Yeah, uh, just the whole thing, you know, energy-wise, just performance-wise, crowd-wise, everything was level up to a 10, up to an 11. Everything was capped off beautifully. Uh, And the visual at the end of Ed walking off the stage and kind of perching himself, I guess, against, uh, I don't know, like a stairwell or something like that, and just head head in his hands. And this must be right before he gets interviewed, like you were saying before. Definitely. Uh, and, you know, he just looks exhausted. Exhausted, but I, there's a sense of pride there, too. There's a sense of, you know, I, I went... And did this. I, I took a chance going from San Diego to Seattle, taking a chance on this band because this was my shot. This was my shot to get here. And it took about two years to do it. But even in those two years, it's it got to be going through your mind. Well, when's the big moment going to come? When's the moment going to come? Right. And then the moment comes it and came. it hits you. <laughs> and it, like, man, I... I can't imagine what's going through his head at that point. Oh, yeah. He, he seemed like an awe look of, all you know, just of what happened. Like, you know, like you said, it took two years for him to get there. There's, you know, 
you, you have to all the cards have to fall right for it to happen. There's obviously people bands have been around for 22 years who've never still never had the opportunity to do that, and so I think he's just sure. just so like not relieved, but like I said, it's just in awe of the whole situation, and you know, and he and he knows he gave it his all. He you know he you know put out a hell of a performance. Um, it, it's hard to truly describe how amazing a performance this is other than for the again 1000th time to say just go yeah. watch it yeah so. that's that's where we'll leave it with this and you know we have to rate it but it's not going to be a secret what everybody rates this i i think it would be unfair to not rate this a 10 um actually oh, 10 yeah 100 yeah. percent um since we're all in agreement to that uh I we did last week we did and I got to remember to do this now since it's now a part of the show uh top 3 moments from this show. So who wants to go first share their top 3? Oh, okay. Good, Bradley. Um well, I would I would to me uh why go was a huge huge um one of my favorite parts. I really liked uh you know like we said the hey 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 intro. I liked uh, how angsty Eddie was. Um so that was that was definitely one of my favorites. Um uh, porch, you can't, you know, like like you guys have said, it's you know one of the like um, one of the pinnacle porches of all time. So you know, so so that would yeah. be there. And then, um, uh, you know, I I'd probably say black. Black was so good. It was you know it was the one kind of like we said the one breather moment in the uh, in the the one lull, if you will. But the thing is, they didn't let it become a lull they just used it as a, as a breather and it was just right, like such right. a powerful emotional performance so so um yeah so i'd probably go with those as my um my favorite parts all right i'm gonna cheat a little bit randy i'm gonna lump a couple things together oh, so the boy. the no the outros of both alive and black i will lump together because they're both outros and they are both equally impactful on my fandom and how much i love them um i will say the stage dive is number two and that whole sequence and then um i think again like just that whole final sequence of pulled up suggestion and free world that combination of listening to eddie have so much fun and then basically flip the switch and all of a sudden he's you know singing free world and screaming um and and the mic solo so just that whole little ending, you know, the, the, the encore, I guess, if we want to call it that, uh, would be moment number three, that, you know, whole little like 10 minute sequence or whatever it is, um, as they wrap everything up and, and really put a bow on what is a gift to everyone that just listened to, uh, what they saw and and heard. I'm going to go top three. Number three is probably, it's not really, it is a part of the show, but it's not. I'm I'm going to go with the camera shots, just the way that nice. the camera was positioned, because I think that without the the placement of the cameras, I don't think it has that. No, yeah, that's very true. Intimacy. That's a good point. So I, I really, I, I that's you know quietly was one of my favorite things, and mm-hmm. and me too. Like I I think that more important to me. Uh, look, Porch is, is iconic and it's quintessential uh, to, to the show and it's quintessential to the band's uh, heritage, so to speak. But it's number two for me because in the end, Ed stage dives all the time at this point. He, you know, this is the this is the one that you see all the pictures of, that you see the clips of, that people outside of Pearl Jam fandom will will mention but right and if it wasn't Pink Pop this. Festival right and if it wasn't Pink Pop if it wasn't on TV right how many other times before this have there been pick would yeah. there have been pictures of him sure. jumping off the rafters and from pipes on the ceiling right <laughs> you know it didn't I matter. get what you mean yeah it didn't matter and I mean Drop in the Park is another one that, that he sure. did it so uh, you know I number one for me again is is pulled up uh, it's just the way that the crowd is mesmerized by this band the whole entire time. They are eating out of, out of the palm of his hands and they're saying, we want more. We want more of this. When's the next album? When's the next single? We, we don't want to leave. We don't want to leave this moment right now. There's nothing more beautiful than this. And, uh, that's, that is Pink Pop 92 in a nutshell. 
Thank would you, you guys pop. say that if you only heard the audio, you guys still would have rate, rated it a 10? Like, if you had no visuals of this at all? Hmm. That's really... That's a great point. It really is. Um, I mean, the audio in and of itself is amazing. But when you put it across 1992 standards and you put it across set lists, and, you know, right now, when you look at it... Uh, I don't know how many years it is. I'm not going to do the math. 27, 28 years later, 26, whatever it is. Uh, it's a common set list, and you think, well, you know, they play all these songs very often, very commonly. These 10 songs can be put in any set in 2019 or 2018. Uh, but you can't look at it that way. Right. And I just feel like a lot of set lists at the time were very much like this, mm -hmm. but you can still feel the energy if you're listening to it. You can still feel their presence. So while... Maybe not a 10, but damn close. Yeah, I would say. I would the, say. The visual element really pushes it over the top. Again, we keep going back to that tipping point point. I think <laughs> that's that's exactly what it is. Right, yeah. Because I know there's a lot of the other bootlegs I've listened to, a lot of them I've only listened to the audio from, and so I just, then it makes it kind of, I think back and wonder, like, how much more I may, I may have liked it had I watched the video of the same show or of the same grouping of songs or something like that. So, right. obviously, this is one that um, that really highlights how, how important or how, how much the video can influence, especially, as you said, Randy, when it's shot so well and, mm -hmm. and you really could, you know, get a good feel for everything. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, you know, again, we're we're a visual generation now. We need yeah. to see everything uh, and we have access to everything. So, you know, just taking things out of the YouTube time capsule and bringing them back. That's I mean, that's what we try to do best. We try to make uh, bring back some good memories and make you forget about the world for a little while so if we did that in this hour and a half however long it took to to get us here today then um you know we did our job so uh let's let's kind of let's kind of finish off here uh just with some live on four legs type news and and notes and things that we usually tell you to do at the at the end of the show or ask you to do. We don't want to tell anybody to do anything. But um, we do want to let you know that uh, there is going to be an anniversary show uh, that's going to be kind of separate from the show shows. Uh, and that'll be kind of like a roundtable with uh, the four legs discussing um, just, you know, where we've we've gone to with the show and over the last year and kind of what to expect moving forward. But an important thing about that is that we're going to do a get ready for this. We've done a lot of giveaways recently, but they've been bootleg giveaways. This is going to be a poster giveaway. Oh, wow. We Ooh. are giving away a poster on our anniversary show. The only thing that you have to do is you have to go to Apple Podcasts, you have to give us a five star rating. And a comment. Let us know what you think of it. What you what your favorite episode is. What your favorite moment is. What you want to hear from us next. And then just uh, drop us a line at live on four legs podcast at gmail .com and just let us know that that you left it because sometimes you know you get usernames and things in there and we're not sure who uh, commented where. But that is your entry into the poster competition and that will be drawn at random. Uh, five stars on Apple Podcast. If you're not listening to, to us on Apple Podcast, if you're on Spotify, I don't know if they have a rating system. If they do, rate us on five five stars on that. Show proof of it, and uh, you will be entered into the contest. And uh, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna reveal what poster it is yet, but uh, I, I I have a feeling people are gonna dig it. So I'm sure they will. Yeah. Uh, and as always, since we're doing uh, the Wednesdays, uh, dropping, dropping shows on Wednesdays now, uh, you guys know the deal now. Trivia on Facebook at about 8 o'clock, maybe 8.30, depending on uh, whatever I have planned that night. So keep it locked. If you're listening to this on Wednesday, there's trivia on Facebook. You cannot miss trivia because we give away free bootlegs 
every single time. So, and they're hard questions. We try to make it easy for everybody. Some of them are very it's hard. Fun. We don't know. We don't know what. I don't know what we're gonna do this week, but uh, we'll make sure it's good. So, uh, keep locked on Facebook for trivia, and as always, patreoncom slash live on four legs. If you'd like to subscribe, we are gonna start to get some stuff rolling on on Patreon very soon, including evolution episodes that I have been bragging about and saying and and promoting for so long. They're coming. We promise. Uh, you know, they might be coming sooner rather than later. So keep an, on the lookout for that. And aside from that, uh, I think we're we're golden here. Um, live on four legs podcast at gmail.com. If you have a show that you would like us to cover that we haven't talked about yet, or you have a point from Pink Pop that we haven't uh, didn't really get to. I, I think we covered. I would just, love to hear it. Yeah, just about everything, but. Any anything right. that you have on this show, just just drop us a line. Uh, how do you feel about your your first uh, official hosting gig today? I, it was great. I felt it like was it great. I well. couldn't have asked for a better show to uh, to to kind of get myself acclimated. Uh, it was honestly, it's one of my favorite shows. So it was it was a pleasure. I love talking about it. Love listening to it. I might go listen to it right now. So <laughs> and and Brad and Bradley. Uh, you know, your second time doing this show, and we'll have you back on in the future too. What? Oh, sure. Uh, do you do you have a plan? I, and I know I kind of threw this on you because uh, our original summer plan was to do a bunch of festival shows, but uh, and I wanted to get you on something, so I figured, you know, since it had been six or seven months since you had been on the show, we'd get you on something really, really good uh, since you've been oh, in yeah. from the beginning. But is there? Uh, what can we look forward to the next time uh, you come on our show? Oh, well, there's a couple shows that I attended that were fun. I liked the uh, Charlottesville show in 13 was a lot of fun. Um, That's London, Ontario in uh, 05 when they did the Canada tour was a cool one. But even aside from that, anytime you'll have me on, I you know, I still love talking about shows. And um, and it's, it's neat to, you know, listen to a show that I wasn't at just to kind of, you know, you know, because like, like as you've, you guys have obviously done this, you know, the whole time. But um, it's neat when you just look at a set list, it seems some things could look really good, some things could look bad. You don't really know until you listen to the whole set list all the way through exactly. the whole show. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's you know, anytime I can have an excuse to listen to a show I haven't already listened to, I would, I'll would i jump at that. And, um, and so, yeah, so I'm down for anything you guys will have me for. And that's, awesome, man. Again, yeah, thank you for coming on and thank you for being a part of this. Bradley is a Patreon subscriber and, uh, you know, not not only that, but he's a good friend of ours too. So if you, if you want to be a Patreon subscriber, head on over, pledge however much uh, you would like. It helps the podcast. It helps us grow. It uh, helps us stay intact as well. Um, but, you know, mo- most importantly – that's your in. If you want us to cover something, that's the best way to do it. And we'll have you on the show to do it with us. So, uh, again, both of you, thank, thank you for coming on. And uh, this is the end. We're here, but not for much longer. And although we may be parting ways, I miss you already. I miss you always. For Buckley and Bradley and the rest of us, Pink Pop in the Netherlands, uh, we will see you next time. The m- well, a match. Well, I just call it a match. It's like five wild bulls on a stage. Well, that's what we, we... Pardon? We were reading a lot of Hemingway at the time, and we were reading about bullfights in Spain. And we couldn't afford to go to Spain, so we just rounded up five guys to recreate the, the bullfight. Uh, Eddie, so pardon? He- we're heavily Hemingway-inspired. <laughs> but how do you... S- how do you regard this playing on a stage? And you just told me about those fifty thousand watchers. I'm not. I'm not even going to be able to comment on that for maybe three or four days when it sinks in, if it ever does. For three or four years. Three or four years, maybe. And we'll look at these pictures that he has, and that'll give us a perspective on like how great of a time it was. <laughs>